This is the first lecture installment for module one, where I will introduce to you terms and direct you through a few thought experiments in order to teach you how to develop an evolutionary mindset. Let's begin. To start off this module, I'd like for each of you to ask yourselves a question. It's a deep question that may take you a while to find the answer for, with words that no doubt will fall short of a comprehensive explanation. The question is, why do you love your family? Some of you may be wondering, did I just stumble upon a philosophy lecture? Or what the hell does this have to do with evolution? Well, hopefully I will be able to connect those dots in the next few minutes. But ask yourself this question again, why do you love your family? And this time try to come up with some type of measurable or tangible answer. This may even sound like a distasteful thing to do considering it is such an intimate and complex emotion, maybe even the pinnacle of all emotions. Let me just add here that I know that there are some exceptions with some people who may not love their family, but let's put aside those exceptions. I'm guessing that most people will have trouble answering this question. Although I assume that given this context, you, uh, that you're right now listening to an evolutionary biology lecture, that you may know where I'm going with this. Let's make it a bit easier and add a degree of separation into the question. Let's think about a different species, one that was mentioned in the first chapter of Camparacus's Understanding Evolution. The species is Canis familiaris, the proverbial man's best friend, better known as the dog. Do dogs love us? And if so, why? Here is a picture of me and my canine companion, Brule. She may or may not be interrupting some of the lectures in the future. Over thousands of years, her ancestors have been artificially selected for a working amicable partnership with humans. One where she does not develop a fear of humans, she can recognize commands, trade physical labor for food, and she no longer has that mammalian reaction of interpreting eye contact as a threat. So does Brule love me? I certainly think so, but for every loving interaction, there is a legitimate scientific explanation as well. When she looks my face, is that her saying, I love you? Or is it an innate behavior that originates from wolf pups encouraging their mother to regurgitate food after she returns from a hunt? Does she follow me around all day because I'm a fun, cool guy or because I'm her sole source of food? Maybe both answers are right. Regardless, we feed dogs, we provide them shelter, we interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis, and this familiarity often leads to a deeper emotional connection. All the same can be said about our family. Maybe dogs are not capable of love the way that we experience it at least and we will never know for certain the answer to this question. It might just be a high degree of loyalty or an association of humans with safety and resources. But go ahead and put this lecture on pause and Google something like lost dog finds family after traveling across country or type into YouTube dog greets owner after returning from the military. And it is clear at least to me that there is something resembling love that is fundamental to those stories. Now, the next interesting step in this thought experiment is to keep adding levels of separations from us humans. Do cats love us? Do elephants love their family? Does a mother goose love her offspring? Do worker ants love their fellow sisters? Do the single-celled Antrococcus faecalis that are living in your gut right now, helping you digest last night's chicken pot pie, love other Enterococcus faecalis cells? I bet I know your answer to at least that last question. So it seems that there's a line drawn somewhere between the expanse that lies within dogs and Enterococcus faecalis. This class does not have anything to do with the determination of the location of this line. That is more of an existential philosophical argument on the sentience of beings. But considering that this first module is named an evolutionary mindset, we can provide a single, albeit perhaps inadequate, answer to all those questions. 
It simply has to do with a series of code made up of A's, C's, T's, and G's cached in the nucleus of every single one of our cells. The fact is that the more closely we are related with somebody, the more alleles or variants of genes we share with that person. So why is this important? Before I answer this question, let's talk about evolution. In Charles Darwin's seminal work on the origin of species, he describes transmutation, now referred to as evolution, as descent with modification. It speaks volumes that this manuscript has survived the test of time and that this description has remained the most elegant description of the process. One driving force behind evolution is natural selection or the widely touted survival of the fittest. It is surprisingly very easy to break down natural biology into a list of rules or relationships. An adaptation of an organism is said to be fit if it results in an increase of successful reproduction, regardless of the other side effects. This means that a behavior that guarantees death can still be fit. Wait a minute, that sounds a little bit strange, doesn't it? Well, see the video of the praying mantis mating for a perspicuous example of this. It can be found on Canvas. But to boil it down, all that matters is the number of offspring produced. In this regard, the survival of the survival of the fittest refers to the survival of the lineage, not of an individual. It is important to note that most of the time, an increase in their survivalship of an individual also increases the reproductive potential, which is why many adaptations directly improve survivorship of the individual. But this is only true because it indirectly leads to more reproductive chances down the line. If you are fast enough to outrun your predators, you will have more chances of meeting a mate in the future. Simple enough. But what about altruistic behavior. And I know you cannot see me, but I'm using air quotes when I say altruistic. One can justifiably argue on either side whether or not true altruism exists in nature. Altruism is defined as behavior by an individual that decreases his or her own fitness, but increases the fitness of another individual. Obviously, there are plenty of instances of altruistic behavior in humans, but there are myriad examples in the natural world as well. How does this fit within the confines of Darwin's theory? Superficially, it seems that it contradicts it, but indirectly, it can still hold true. From the point of view of your genes, you can still display adaptive behavior by helping others who are related to you while sacrificing opportunity for yourself. Siblings are on average 50% identical by descent. Nieces and nephews are 25% identical. Cousins are 12.5% identical and it dilutes quickly from there. So you can picture it this way. If you are in a small band of humans foraging for berries, you may decide that it's a good idea to find high ground and look out for predators, an action called vigilance in the animal behavior world. Those individuals that you interact with are most likely related to you. So odds are you will be helping out some relatives and some non-relatives to boot. So is this an evolutionarily favorable strategy? Well, we, we can't know for sure unless we take some measurements. Take a second to guess at what sort of things we might need to measure in order to answer this question. we would need to statistically calculate the risk of predation with and without a lookout, the degree of relatedness of everybody benefiting from the lookout. And finally, we would need to calculate the penalty associated with being the lookout. When we are considering the degree of relatedness of the benefactors, this is a term called kin selection, which basically means that favoring the reproductive success of your relatives is evolutionarily favorable because you are still indirectly spreading your own genes, albeit to a lesser, more diluted extent. So when considering whether a behavior is favorable, 
we should not only consider the fitness of an individual acting, but also the effect on fitness of relatives who will also benefit. This is known as inclusive fitness or direct plus indirect fitness. When asked if he would save his life, when he asked if he would give his life to save his drowning brother, English geneticist J.B.S. Haldane once famously joked, no, I would willingly die for two brothers or eight cousins. This quote should now make sense if you understand the implications of indirect fitness. Going back to the previous set of questions, let's consider calculating the penalty associated with being the lookout, that is being the altruistic individual. By penalty, I, don't, I do not necessarily mean the likelihood of the lookout dying. On the contrary, this individual is probably the safest in the group as he or she is the only one staying vigilant. By penalty, I mean the opportunity cost. The lookout is not foraging, so he or she is losing out on calories, which affects your energy budget, immune system, and ultimately your reproductive potential. If the evolutionary benefits of this behavior outweighs the cost, it can be selected for. Meerkats, scientific name Suricata Suricata, show this exact behavior. One individual stands watch while the others forage. What about altruistic behaviors that do not benefit your relatives? This can still hold true evolutionarily because of reciprocal altruism. This is the official term for the you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours relationship. This is altruistic behavior with the expectation that the recipient will return the favor. For example, reciprocal altruism is seen in vampire bats that bring back meals to the roost for those who are unable to find meals. These may be sick, old, young, or simply unlucky individuals. It's the equivalent of a neighbor keeping an eye on your house while you're out of town. There is an underlying expectation of future reciprocity during the time of vulnerability. So let's tie this all together. Why do we love our family? Perhaps it's a form of kin selection. We love people who share our genetics. Why do we develop a tight-knit community with our neighbors? You could argue it's for reciprocal altruism. We bond with people who may benefit us in the future. Moving on to fitness, survivorship is only important insofar as it increases our chances at spreading our genes. So all types of behavior that we can notice in the wild, mating, fighting, hunting, playing, courting, are ultimately connected to spreading genes. The final question here is, why is it important or the right thing to do to make sure as an individual that our genes get passed on either through reproduction or through the success of our relatives? It's not, or at least I would argue that it's not. Just because something is evolutionarily favorable does not mean it's morally or ethically superior. It is simply a truism that the adaptations which increase the spread of genes will be favored in nature because genes are the blueprints that code for structures and behaviors that make these adaptations possible. It's a never ending cycle between genetics coding for adaptations and adaptations resulting in the spread of genetics. It is completely independent of any sort of moral code. A term that all students should know when being introduced into, into the evolutionary theory world is the naturalist fallacy. You cannot substantiate something as good just because it exists in the natural world. We fall into this trap as cons uh, all the time as consumers. Companies may advertise shampoos with all natural ingredients and consumers automatically equate this with some type of moral high ground even though more information is needed to necessarily make this determination. There are many naturally occurring substances that are bad, like anthrax, arsenic, 
and botulism, to name a few. There are many natural behaviors that are bad, like infanticide seen in this picture. A new alpha male lion may kill lion cubs to free up females to mate. Female hamsters may eat their own babies as a reaction to stress. Fledglings of many species of birds, like red-tailed hawks, often kill off the weakest sibling by pecking it to death or throwing it out of the nest. This ensures that the strongest of the siblings will be provided with the maximum amount of food. These are all natural behaviors that exist in nature. On the flip side, not all artificial products are bad. First of all, consumers may say that they want products that are chemical free, which is necessarily an impossibility and a ridiculous thing to say as all matters, all matter is made up of chemicals. That point aside, there are countless artificial things, meaning not occurring in nature, that are helpful to humans, like drugs, medical implants, fabrics, and sterilizing agents, to name a few. So the only real way to determine if something is safe or harmful is not to simply label it as natural versus artificial, but to look at the specific mechanisms of interaction between the product and humans and measure the positive and negative effects at specific levels of exposure. So let's wrap this all up. There seems to be a genetic component to love that is substantiated by evolutionary theory. But one could, and I believe should, argue that there is more to love than simply spreading of genetic information. Evolutionary fitness is usually thought as the, the ability to survive, but actually can be boiled down to the ability to reproduce, which then can be reduced even further into the ability to proliferate genes that are common to you in your own genome into the future. And finally, even if something exists in nature or is substantiated by evolutionary theory, it says absolutely nothing about its moral standing. If fitness and morality were in fact linked, the greatest individual in the history of mankind would not be somebody like Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr. or Mahatma Gandhi. It would be Genghis Khan, the founder of the Mongol empire that killed 40 million people in the 11 and 1200s. Throughout his life, he fathered hundreds of children. He now has over 16 million descendants across the world today. How about that for inclusive fitness?